If you are close to retirement or recently retired, you can't afford to miss this commercial. What if I told you one of the biggest dangers to running out of money in retirement was a risk you've never heard of before? If you've never heard of Sequence of Return Risk, please check out the trailer at sequenceofreturnrisk.com. And remember, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Benjamin Franklin. Okay, cool. It looks like we are... Uh... It looks like we're live. So one of the things I really wanted to talk about today was when I <clears throat> actually let me try to uh, switch this screen view over here just a second now. Actually, where? All right, here we go. All right, yeah. One of the main things I want to talk about today is you know I'm perusing the internet and see you know guys like Joseph Stiglitz call Bitcoin uh, you know say it should be banned because you know nobody can control it and it's just you know a gigantic bubble. So actually, let me go to. Uh, Go to the article over here on CoinDesk. And so it seems to me it should be outlawed. It doesn't serve any useful uh, social function. And what I really want to talk about today is I really want to compare Bitcoin to actually the dollar. Because when people want to start talking about bubbles, people want to start talking about you know how overvalued certain things are. What they need to understand is that what they are actually comparing this to. So you, I'm right now I'm at visualcapitalist.com. They've got a lot of really great infographics. And what's, what we see here is that each one of these dot, or which one, each one of these squares represents $100 billion. So you see the market cap of silver, you know, not very big. You see, you know, the various cryptocurrencies. And again, this is probably from a few months ago. So it's a, you know, maybe this, these blocks are maybe twice the size now. But all the cryptocurrencies, very, very small compared to, you know, here's all the you know, major corporations, the richest people in the world, again, each one of these blocks represents, what was it, $100 billion. You've got the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Again, this is a little bit outdated because now it's about $4.5 trillion. Uh, all the different currencies in the world, and this is going to be, you know, the you know the value if they were to actually, you know, uh, you know that you could actually spend in the economy. Then you've got gold. Then you've got the various stock markets around the world. And again, let's go back to uh, cryptocurrency right there all the various stock markets in the world, uh, you know, obviously a whole hell of a lot larger than the supply of Bitcoin, the global money supply. Now you see this uh, pretty big. And again, this is probably outdated. So uh, a little bit outdated. So you know, this number is probably even more gigantic. Then once you start getting into just the developed markets, global debt, you know, it's a staggering amount. I mean, so we want to talk about what the bubble is. I mean, it looks like the global debt right there, you know, when you've got, you know, this much currency, this much debt, you could use all of your money and all you'd have left is a pile of debt. However, but you know, I feel like the, uh, what is it? The, like the, one of those like ShamWow guys, it's like, but wait, there's more. And what the more is, is if we go over to the global real estate index over here, I mean, just look at how much, you know, the notional value of all the real estate. Then when you really want to get into things, why don't you start looking at the derivatives? So right now what I'm doing is I'm taking a look at the derivatives uh, it's estimated here that it's 544 trillion dollars. So what I'm doing right now is scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. And again, there's other estimates that the uh, real derivative exposure might be actually more than a quadrillion dollars. Yeah, a quadrillion dollars. So over here to the right is uh, Bitcoin, uh, obviously one very small, tiny little block now, because again, this is a little bit outdated, uh, which not that outdated, probably like uh, this is earlier this month. Now Bitcoin has two little blocks. So if we compare the world's debt to Bitcoin, it's actually no comparison at all. Now, the other thing I want to do is this is probably my favorite video pretty much of all time. And I want to get my face off the screen so you guys will be able to see this. But so I'm going to blow up this video and what this video does a great job explaining is really how the system is rigged. I'm not going to play this whole entire video. I'm only going to play about three minutes of it. But it, this is the most important video I think you could possibly see if you want to, you know, make sure you know you know as much as you possibly can about money. This is called the Hidden Secrets of Money, Part Four. Highly, highly recommend it. Again, I'm only going to play a couple minutes of it, but here we go. Them all. Before the establishment of the Federal Reserve, there was no need for personal income tax. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913, and that very same year, the Constitution was amended to allow income tax. Do you really think this was just a coincidence? Ask yourself how much income tax you've paid over your lifetime. Much of it 
has been silently siphoned away into the hands of those who own the system. Yes, this system has owners. Who they are is an even bigger secret that we'll get to shortly. But first, we need to understand the mumbo-jumbo of the so-called debt ceiling. It's all based on a huge paradox. There was interest due on that bond. And there was interest due on every one of those loans that the banks made. That means that there is interest due on every dollar in existence. Let me ask you something. If you borrow the very first dollar into existence, and that's the only dollar that exists on the planet, but you promise to pay it back plus another dollar's worth of interest, where do you get the second dollar to pay the interest? The answer is that you have to borrow that one into existence and promise to pay it back with interest as well. So now there are two dollars in existence, but you owe four. And so on and so on. The result is there's never enough currency to pay the debt. There is always more debt in the system than there is currency in existence to pay the debt. Therefore, the whole system is impossible. It is finite. It will come to an end one day. What would happen if the government stopped borrowing to do deficit spending? Are the payments on those treasury bonds going to stop? What would happen if the public stopped borrowing and going deeper into debt? Are your house and car payments going to stop? No. There is a payment due every month on the principal plus the interest on every dollar in existence and those payments do not stop. If we stop borrowing, then no new currency is created to replace the currency that we used to make those payments. Whether you're making a payment on a loan or paying tax to make a payment on a bond, the portion of the payment that goes to pay off the principal extinguishes that portion of the debt. But the debt also extinguishes the currency. Important part to currency and debt are like matter and antimatter. When they meet, they annihilate each other. If we just pay off the principal only on all the loans and bonds that exist, the entire currency supply just vanishes. So if we don't go deeper into debt every year, look what happens. The whole thing goes into a deflationary collapse under the weight of those payments. Politicians and pundits alike talk about all right, and that was uh, really the main gist of what I wanted to talk about is that the actual current monetary system as it as it is today is finite. It's going to end at some point. There's no the only way to get a dollar into existence, not the only way, but the way that, you know, our rulers have chosen uh, for money to come into the system is that we have to borrow that dollar. So what that means is the very first dollar that was created December 23rd, 1913 had interest on it. So at the end of year one, you owed 4% interest. Well, what happens if you start, if you try to pay back that dollar for with the dollar? There's mathematically, there's no way you can ever pay that back. So what you have to do is you have to then borrow another dollar. And then when you borrow that other dollar, then you're getting yourself further and further and further into debt. And it's really this form of high tech slavery that there's actually no way to to ever really get out of. So when you're trying to call out scams, you know, you got all these different, you know, Nobel Peace Prize winners like Joseph Stieglitz, which again, the, uh, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize at this point is a complete joke. But, you know, that aside, you know, how come they're not pointing out the inequities of the current system? Again, people like me are the ones who are benefiting from this current system, you know, working in the financial markets where when the Fed prints more money, then it goes into financial assets, which, you know, makes the value of those assets go up, meaning I end up getting more money. So, I'm really speaking out against my own self-interest as as it relates to the system because I know at some point it's going to end. And is cryptocurrency, you know, the only savior for it? You know, probably not. And um, you know, but I do think that you know it could be a good hedge. Again, it's uh, you know it's highly highly speculative. The amount of you know risk associated with Bitcoin is is great. Uh, but I'd say the amount of risk in our current system is is great as well. And I do have a you know long list of disclosures because I am in the process or I, I was in the process of not, was I am currently and now I'm definitely hightailing things uh, of opening up a cryptocurrency company. And part of that company is I wanted to make sure that people understood the risks that are out there. You know, it's extremely volatile. There's short track records. There's new coins that could maybe even displace you know Bitcoin. You know, it's an ever evolving marketplace. You could have government laws, hacking, quantum computing. There's the safety of the exchanges, you know, losing your private keys, you know, no uh, like mulligans or redos. You know, there's no really central authority, which for me is a good thing. Uh, you know, there is currency risk. There's geopolitical risk. Again, I think this could help solve some of the geopolitical risk. But, you know, th this is not some risk-free 
proposition. And what I really fear now is that there's people who are going to be getting into this because they think it's a way to make a lot of money, not because that they are, you know, philosophical libertarians, not because they're, uh, you know, anarcho capitalists, not because they think the system is rigged, simply getting into this because they think it's an avenue to make a lot of money. And I think that some of those people who are getting into it for that attitude might end up losing a lot because this is going to be highly volatile, especially once the, um, what's it called? The, uh, futures market goes live in about two weeks from now, two and a half weeks from now, you know, you're going to see probably, you know, uh, quite a bit of volatility. And so if you can't stomach, you know, the price of your Bitcoin going down to 2000 or going down to 1000, then you know what, you probably shouldn't be in it because, you know, a lot of us are in this for the long haul. And there's probably gonna be a lot of weak hands that end up losing a lot of money in cryptocurrency. And another thing that I see a lot of people doing that, uh, you know, is really kind of uh, disturbing is if we look at uh, you know, coinmarketcap.com, or you can go to coincap.io. And what you can see is the relative, uh, circ- or you can see the circulating supply. So people, a lot of times people will say, well, Ethereum is a better platform. And, and yeah, I'm one of those people saying that. But, you know, Ethereum has 96 million tokens or ethers that are out there. And I guess not a token, a coin, 96 million coins that are out there. Whereas Bitcoin has, I don't say only, but there's 16 million. So you can't compare the price of something that has 16 million to the price of something that has 96 million because you're not dealing with the same, uh, you know, same denominator in that. So really, you'd have to multiply the price of Ethereum by, you know, whatever the difference is to really see, uh, you know, get a true price comparison relative to Bitcoin. So I actually have come up with a Bitcoin relative price index that I'm waiting to get the APIs, APIs on and trying to have that go live. But, you know, it's just really frustrating because I see people saying like, like, oh, if Bitcoin is 10,000, then how come Ethereum can't be five? Well, there's a lot more supply. And it's the same thing, especially with the one that really gets me that I see a lot of people getting bamboozled in would be uh, Ripple. So with Ripple, what is this, 38 billion supply. And so people are saying, oh, my God, it, you know, back when it was like 22 cents or 19 cents, like this is, you know, this penny crypto. Well, what you don't under, it's not a penny crypto because, you know, if you take a look at the actual market cap, it's $10 billion. Which is, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of cash right there, a lot of coin. Not to, uh, not to try to be punny over here, but you've got 38 billion of them. So, you know, the supply of Bitcoin at 16 billion versus the supply of Ripple at 38 billion, and something that people aren't even taking into account. And then when it comes to myot or iotas, these are actually measured in the in uh, expressed as a million iota or a myota. So that's another thing a lot of people aren't really aware of uh you know some other things people aren't really aware of when it comes to this is the different transaction fees so on here i have the transaction fees going back from the last year and i'm using some of the coins on here like ethereum bitcoin cash dash uh through bitcoin golden here as well uh litecoin and ethereum classic to really t- try to get a handle on what the uh what the average price is because we did see a lot of price spikes earlier earlier this year so again the uh the uh, what is this? The y-axis. You're only at a dollar forty at the very top. But if you take a look at some of these currencies, like Ethereum Classic, it's not even like a penny to trade. Litecoin, and this was back. Uh, actually, let's let's just go to whatever today is. Okay, so you know Ethereum Classic, you're looking at two cents. Litecoin looking at fourteen cents. Bitcoin Gold, you know six cents. Bitcoin Cash, seventeen cents. Ethereum, thirty cents. And where this really starts going into play is what I don't have on here, but I will shortly. Bitcoin. So now that we add Bitcoin to the mix, and let me uh, zoom in over here for you guys, uh, is you know Bitcoin way the hell higher than everything else. So you know Bitcoin, you know four dollar transaction fees, five dollar transaction fees. You know at one point, you know it was like nineteen or I know people that paid up to twenty six dollars for a transaction fee before, and so that's why some of these other currencies are gaining strength is because Bitcoin is trying to proposition itself as being the gold of the market where, you know, we don't care if people aren't using our currency to buy bubblegum with, because what we really wanted to do is, you know, when you really need to make a big purchase or you need to move, uh, you know, you want to go buy a house or you want to go buy a car, you know, that's what we want to position Bitcoin as. But the problem is that's not what Bitcoin was sold to people as. Bitcoin was sold to people as, you know, this is an anonymous way to trade. Well, it's not really that anonymous. Uh, you know, there are ways for people to go find out what you're doing. It was sold 
uh, to the community as, you know, this is going to be, you know, this, this way where, you know, you can transact, you know, instantly and it's going to cost next to nothing. Well, you know, if you want to give somebody, you know, 30 cents or a dollar or chip in for this, you know, this need or GoFundMe and, or if you want to, you know, tip somebody or you're at a website and you want to support somebody and you want to chip in $2, well, you're not going to chip in $2 if it costs you 20 effing dollars to do a transaction fee. And so that's where, you know, philosophically, I don't really agree with the Bitcoin people because I, for one, think that Bitcoin ended up getting hijacked by, uh, you know, I don't want to say the globalists, but, you know, people that maybe don't even understand, uh, you know, basic economics that are that are coming up with this, coming up with these schemes. So when it comes to Bitcoin Cash, all they did was say, OK, well, we're having a problem right now. The problem is that. Uh, you know, there's scaling issues. There's problem that the fees are costing way too high. So we're just gonna instead of having one meg, we're, instead of having a one megabyte block, we're just gonna make it eight. And, you know, problem solved. And now the Bitcoin people said, well, no, we don't want to do it that way. We can't increase the block size because you know, you know, God forbid we increase it to eight because you know, again, we're talking about megabits. You know, super super small amount. I mean, there's no reason why it couldn't get a little bit a little bit more. Uh, so they want to do this other convoluted process called SegWit. And honestly, there's the argument to be made that Bitcoin Cash is a lot more like the original Bitcoin than even what they now refer to as Bitcoin. Again, I, this is covered in the uh, Cryptos and Conspiracies podcast, episode one. Uh, that's just one of the things I wanted to get into. Also, you know, as I'm perusing Facebook and now I've joined a couple of these groups, uh, what I've noticed lately is that there's people in there who are saying like, oh, yeah, I don't really know anything about cryptocurrencies and I don't really know anything about day trading and I don't really have the time to day trade. And, and now I hear that there's like bots that will day trade for you. Well, you know what? I hope that person loses all their money because you have no business, you know, probably a day trading. B, day trading in Bitcoin, especially if you don't know what it is. And, and, you, and so I think there's a lot of people that are going to be separated from their money real quick. And uh, it's going to be unfortunate because Bitcoin will, at that point, get some bad PR. You know, they're trying to make it out like, oh, my God, it's this platform where only drug dealers are using it. Well, the terrorists are financing it. Well, you know, who and I'm not even going off any notes here. So this is just rambling at this point. But who uh, who actually funded Osama bin Laden? Osama bin Laden, when uh, it was, you know, it was guys like uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski through Jimmy Carter, where they were where they were funding the Mujahideen, where, you know, he was actually a CIA asset underneath the name Tim Osmond. This is all declassified. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is actual true fact. You know, who are the ones who were help funding, you know, Saddam Hussein? Who are the ones who gave North Korea the, uh, you know, the, all the nuclear weapons? Oh, would that be America? Would that be the U.S. dollar in every one of those cases? So it's actually, you want to look at, you know, drug dealing, you want to look at terrorism, it's the U.S. dollar is the one that is actually the one that is funding most of that stuff. So if you want to say, oh, because there's some people using this for bad stuff. Well, you know what? I know that it's the government are the bad people. And I know it's the government using things for bad for bad stuff. And when we get back to, you know, the chart where we showed all the other cryptos in, or we showed all the, you know, all the world derivative debt. So each one of these blocks represents $100 billion dollars. Look at the amount of world derivative debt. And again, this is the lowball estimate of 544 billion dollar or trillion dollars of derivatives uh, where the high end estimates, you know, I've seen some that are in, into the quadrillions. Uh, and then we, we can bear that to a market cap of Bitcoin at 2 billion or sorry, two, uh, close to 200 billion or now it's like 160 billion. I guess it depends on what second you're actually asking. But, uh, you know, it's the dollar that is is the bubble, you know, in the interim, yeah, the dollar could get stronger because there's actually places where that where their currency is even worse than the dollar, like over in Europe. But as other currencies uh, even weaken against the dollar, that's going to be good news for cryptocurrencies for those other uh, for those because those other countries are are going to want to get into cryptocurrencies. In Venezuela, the only reason there's people even eating right now, uh, or the reason some people are eating is because there's 100,000 people mining Bitcoin in Venezuela. And that's like the only way they're avoiding, you know, uh, having to like prostitute themselves in order to go eat because, you know, the the wonders of socialism is working so well down in Venezuela. And, I, and I've seen other reports where Stiglitz was actually, you know, talking about what a great job Venezuela was doing several years ago. So if you think that, you know, I'm scared about getting into Bitcoin because Joseph Stiglitz, you know, uh, is now saying it's a fraud and you've got all these other people like Warren Buffett saying it's a Ponzi scheme. Well, these guys are making money off the po ultimate Ponzi scheme, which is the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar, the only way to get it into into circulation is to print, is to have a corresponding dollar of debt. That dollar of debt has interest on it. There's no way to mathematically 
mathematically to pay that off. It's a complete scam. The biggest scam that's ever been going on in the history of the world is cryptocurrency something that can solve it. Yes. Will crypto cryptocurrency solve it? I don't know, but I think people need to be hedged multiple ways. I think people, you know, it is smart if you have, you know, a small allocation of your wealth, you know, three to 5% in these uh, assets, but just know it's highly volatile. Just know it's highly speculative. Just know that you should, you should do your research and not just take someone's word for it to get into something. You know, I'm hope to come up with a lot more stuff about cryptocurrencies. It's something I've been following for a very, very long time, although it wasn't really until about like, uh, I'd say about April of this year where I really took a hard dive into all this and probably studied, probably put more time into this issue than just about anyone out there the past, uh, you know, past about 10 months or so. But well, yeah, but when it comes to, you know, financial advisors, I don't think there's anyone that's put more work into this than me, uh, particularly this year of really trying to do a deep dive and understanding as much as you possibly can, because there's so many different facets of this, of this that makes it interesting. So you've got the, you know, the geopolitical facet of our current monetary system. I guess you've got the, uh, so I guess that'd be the monetary aspect of it. Then you've got the geopolitics of, you know, all these, you know, crazy dictators around the world and, you know, all the other countries are in just as much debt as we are. Or, or even more, um, and then you've got, you know, just then it, then it gets down to you know the underlying technology of blockchain. It gets down to so many different issues, and you know, and honestly, I hope the price of it goes down because what's happening is everyone's holding on. Nobody wants to sell, so when you've got no one selling and people wanting to buy, the price is going to skyrocket. But once we see. Uh, the futures market coming in line, you know, I expect even more volatility. I expect, you know, Wall Street to try to, you know, foist a bunch of, you know, different pump and dump schemes on people. I see, you know, you know, Wall Street wanting to maybe make shorts uh, through the futures market and buy the real Bitcoin through, you know, however they end up wanting to buy it. But, you know, th those games will be played, you know, buyer beware, make sure you are, you know, read up before you do anything like this. Make sure that you're not just taking people's word for it. Make sure that you're not just blindly throwing money. Make sure that you've got some sort of plan. And, you know, make sure that, you know, let's say you're 55 years old, maybe doing traditional stuff. You come up with a plan where we know that this is the uh, this is you taking on the least amount of risk to be able to hit your financial goals. And then now we've got, you know, a, a kitty of money on the side. And then that side money we can then use to maybe invest into different cryptocurrencies. But it's having that plan in place, not just throwing everything into this because, uh, you know, it is looking a little bit bubbly now uh, in the short run, in the long run. You know, you take a look at the world derivative supply, you know, it's the dollar, it's the other currency, it's head of the bubble, uh, especially since there's no way to pay pay this debt. You could tax everybody 100%, assume they still work the same, they obviously wouldn't, and you can't pay it off. You take everyone's assets, everyone, all the money everybody has, tax them 100%, you can't pay it off. If you did pay it off, there'd only be debt left, no more money, and the whole system would collapse. Peace out. One of the most important steps anyone can take in investing is figuring out how much risk they can handle. We use a tool called Riskalyze, which gives you a custom risk number between zero and 100, with 100 being the riskiest asset you could have in your portfolio and one being the least. In five minutes, we can tell you what your risk number is, and if you'd like, we can arrange to also tell you how much risk is in your portfolio, as well as what the hidden internal fees are, dividends are. This is incredibly valuable information you want to help prepare for your retirement. We know that not everyone who does this will become clients, but if you found this useful, please share this on your social media feeds. If you want to find out how much risk is in your portfolio, please email info at focalpointwealth.com or please call 480-771-PLAN or 7526. Thank you. Are you interested in learning more about your social security options? If so, we may have the perfect tool for you. You can get started by clicking on the banner ad above or the link below. From there, you simply enter your basic information and spouse information if that applies. Next, enter your full retirement age benefit amount. Then on the next screen, you can toggle your social security start date along with your spouses to see how that affects your cumulative lifetime benefits. Finally, at the end, you will be able to see how much money you are potentially leaving on the table with your current selection. And if you'd like to schedule a free consultation where we can take a deeper dive into your social security options using the more advanced version of this tool, please leave your contact info on the final screen along with the best time to contact you. If you get to the end and don't want to be contacted, that's fine too. 
but we hope that if you found value in this tool that you can share the page with a friend on your social media feeds to help spread the word. We appreciate you visiting our site and we hope to earn your business someday. And remember, at Focal Point Wealth Management, your future is our focus. Over the last nine years of my career as a financial planner, one common theme emerges amongst retirees. Tim, I wish I knew this information when I was starting out because if I did, I would be in a much different place today. If you are a millennial or are close to one that you care about, please share millennialinvestorblog.com with them. Whether it's learning the differences between an IRA and Roth IRA or the importance of saving early, we've got them covered. We also have a place for them to open up their own retirement accounts for as little as $5,000. If they want our help, we'd be more than happy to assist them, but if they want to do it on their own, then that's fine too. Millennialinvestorblog.com, where millennials' future is our focus.